Well, I just wanted to welcome everybody a good morning and a good afternoon uh, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group uh, based in Washington, DC. We wanna welcome uh, Slovak Prime Minister uh, Heger to today's timely conversation. Prime Minister, great to see you. Uh, uh, it's your afternoon, our morning uh, in snowy Washington, DC. I think we saw a few snowflakes today. Um, so it's great to have you here. My name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a senior fellow and director of democracy initiatives um, at GMF. And I also direct the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. I'm pleased to be joined by my GMF colleague, Martina Horblova, who's gonna moderate today's session. Um, as I mentioned, Mr. Prime Minister, um, it's really a pleasure to have you here um, at such a busy time. Uh, the German Marshall Fund in the United States has long been engaged in, in Central Europe, in Slovakia, including uh, previously having an office in Bratislava. And so we're really, we have a deep connection in the history, uh, both uh, with your country and also region as well. And we're just pleased to be here today. Now we know um, that this has been a particularly challenging, uh, not only just period, uh, just a few weeks for Slovakia, but also really over the last 20 months or so, uh, when your government uh, came to power after an election, and we, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with the, the Slovak people um, and uh, who are experiencing what many are experiencing globally. And I know that is foremost on your mind um, as, as leader. And we're, you know, we're really pleased that you could join us even with the challenges uh, that, are, that you're facing, the country is facing right now. Um, we're also here today, I think it's two weeks before uh, the upcoming Summit for Democracy, which is uh, led by the Biden administration. And I, I think, uh, I know our conversation is going to touch on a number of topics today, but I, I think it's fair to say when we talk about democracy and challenges to countries uh, like Slovakia, uh, the transatlantic community, and even in the United States, then when you look at countries that have stepped up over the last uh, several months and years, um, Slovakia is really Slovakia is really front and center. And I wanted to just highlight as we have the conversation today, uh, what has been your country's leading role uh, as a key transatlantic partner in support of strengthening democracy, tackling corruption, advancing human rights, and really and defending against authoritarians. Um, at GMF, we are especially pleased over the last uh, several weeks to have worked closely with your ambassador um, and your embassy in Washington, DC to help focus uh, not only attention to challenges, including anti-corruption, but to work together on a recently released report focused on support for investigative journalism and investigative journalists and their efforts to combat corruption um, and the importance of independent media. So I'm, I'm gonna make a small plug for this uh, for this report, but what it is really meant to do is to help inform other countries um, as they look at making uh, their decisions on deliverables and engagement at the summit on what they might want to do. And I know Slovakia has been leading uh, not only on investigative journalism, but countering corruption and renewing democracy, both at home and abroad. So I think it, without, without going any further, I think it's important to highlight that uh, your government and and uh, and those the civil society community and media in Slovakia are really uh, you know uh, are a shining beacon of what I think the United States and others are trying to accomplish at this upcoming summit for democracy. And we know that your government is hard at work thinking about what what it will put into its presentation on the 9th and 10th. So with that said, beyond the democracy challenge, we know that there will be other issues, as we mentioned earlier, uh, from climate change to COVID-19, but also security challenges in the transatlantic community, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, that really uh, seized your government, but also the United States. And we're talking about uh, addressing challenges, including Russia, the situation in Belarus as well, an energy crisis that has hit uh, the European continent and globally. And so there isn't a shortage of issues, both domestic and international. And we appre deeply appreciate your leadership and that of your government uh, and an opportunity to speak with you today about these challenges and areas of cooperation, including with the United States. 
So with that said, on behalf of GMF, again, we're really pleased uh, to have you join us today in the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. I'm gonna send it over to my colleague, Martina Hervlova. Uh, Martina, thank you again for hosting this and um, all the work behind the scenes to get, uh, to get this in place today. And also my colleague, John Alexander in Washington, DC. Thank you so much. Martina, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce our guest today. Prior to assuming his current position, the Prime Minister of Slovakia, Eduard Heger, served as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of the Slovak Republic. From 2016 to 2020, he was a member of the parliament where he led the work of the Committee for Military Intelligence Oversight and was a member of the Economic and Foreign Affairs Committees. Mr. Heger also have, has a vast experience from various management positions working for the private sector of Slovakia. He graduated uh, from trade and marketing at the University of Economics in Bratislava. He's married and a proud father of four. Welcome again, Mr. Prime Minister. It's our tremendous pleasure to host you today. Our time is short, so with your permission, I will dive straight into the questions we have for you today. And let me start with the state of democracy. So my first question to you would be, in your opinion, what are the major challenges facing democracy in Slovakia, Central Europe, and globally? Hmm. Well, thank you very much. First of all, uh, once again, uh, hello to uh, everybody from Slovakia. We had some snow yesterday as well. Uh, actually, over the weekend, and it's gone now. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be part of the, this uh, discussion, and uh, I'm looking forward also to the questions from the audience. Well, uh, when we speak about challenges in the field of democracy, well, we just celebrated uh, the 30 32nd uh, anniversary of uh, the 17th November, the Velvet Revolution, as, as you know. And uh, when we remembered uh, the time of 1989, uh, we came back to the transition that happened uh, in that period, in the Velvet Re uh, uh, Revolution. The transition was to, uh, to uh, democracy, to economy, uh, of a market economy, and also we cut off uh, all the connections from the Soviet Union. And the ambition was to establish uh, a state of rule of law and also uh, a free society. This is a uh, really a difficult process and looking 32 years back we see that uh, there is still a lot of challenges to to make this happen because the final goal is to plan this into the minds uh, of the pop of the population of the people actually leaving uh, the democracy uh, in minds of the people and the pandemic as we experiencing especially in Slovakia but I think also in the central Europe and we can see it around the world as well but uh, especially in this, uh, this, uh, uh, this part of the world, we see that it showed how much we succeeded or how much we didn't succeed yet. Uh, because there is so much aggression. Uh, and I understand there is, uh, there is a reason to it because we have lockdowns and all these necessary measures. But, uh, you know, when we were dreaming about a free world, we, we dreamed about freedom, to responsibility, not freedom to aggression, not freedom to selfishness, not freedom to anarchy. That's very important to say. So, so freedom's been uh, interpreted, uh, especially over these two years, in, in several ways, and we see how it could be disinterpreted, uh, disinterpreted. So when we speak about the democracy, we see that we are still at the, at the path of challenges uh, to build a state of rule of law, especially having governments who didn't really, uh, I would say, obey, who didn't really work on it. So, so we have to reestablish uh, this whole atmosphere, this whole uh, value, set of value in, in the society, and also making uh, legislation steps to, to enforce, uh, to enforce uh, the democracy roots uh, in, uh, in Slovakia. But uh, I think uh, that's why it's so important to speak about the, the true democracy, the true values of democracy, the true values of, of freedom. And these are, these are the challenges I see also in the Central Europe. And uh, that's why it's so important uh, to put also a lot of effort on cooperation. You know, European Union is our living area. And we see that 
there are be this is being questioned even more. We knew and we saw that over the in the last decade we had people who were questioning, uh, but these were these were the very extreme right, I would say. Now there is there is other people who are thinking whether this is a um, uh, this is. Uh, this works so well because in the pandemic we saw that there was closing of the borders. Uh, the the states wanted to help, of course, first their their citizens. But I'm so glad that the European Commission mobilized itself so quickly and responded with different instruments, with different uh, aid, and also the recovery plan came. This was so expedited that uh, it really showed that the European uh, Union is a, a vital and, and a good project and, a, and we definitely need to work on it and, and we are on board uh, as a Slovakia. So this is what we want to, uh, want to strengthen. What we see when we speak about Central Europe and, and also globally, I would say, we need to look at our neighbors. Uh, my government, uh, we decided that we're going to strengthen our relationship with all the neighbors, including Ukraine. I myself, uh, was four times in Ukraine over the eight months I've been uh, uh, prime minister because it's so important for us to invest into this uh, relationship with our eastern neighbor for several reasons. Also because of the uh, uh, of the economics and, and uh, population uh, living close together, but also from the security reason, also from the global reason. So. So we, we want to be as a Slovakia, even though uh, somebody might say a, a small country in the heart of the Europe, we want to be a trendsetter in certain areas. And definitely the, uh, the, the area as a rule of law and, and uh, democracy, this is the topic where we definitely want to belong among the trendsetters. Thank you, Prime Minister. And you made a very important point. I like to say that democracy is a process and there will always be new challenges. And I, I want to follow up specifically on one of the challenges. You didn't explicitly name it, uh, but you sort of alluded to it. And it's this information and how social media are being increasingly weaponized. Uh, so how can governments and other stakeholders ensure free, fair and transparent media in today's, uh, today's hostile environment? Thank you very much. Uh, it actually very much follows up to what's being said, because as we see the aggression, growing aggression and the misunderstanding of democracy and freedom, uh, it shows that especially this disinformation uh, wants, wants to capture the mind of the, the people, of the citizens, and uh, so much lies that's been in the environment over these last two years. It's, it's, it's been growing. I mean, I can say that we are battlefield, especially in Slovakia, but I think it's uh, also other countries, but, but we experience it very much because the social media is something that, uh, where you can post anything. And, and we see that uh, combating, uh, combating this uh, disinformation is, is not an easy process. And when we speak about what we can do, well, again, first of all, it goes, it's based on the values of the state. Uh, and how much the people are educated uh, on the values of democracy, on the values of freedom. So that's why a long-term and ongoing process is the education, investment in education. This is why we decided that we're going to invest uh, a lot of uh, money, over 900 million euros out of recovery plan into the education, uh, because we see that this, we must, uh, we must uh, bring it up. We've been going down in the in the, all the ratings over the last decade. Another thing is, so this is the, I would say, strengthening resilience of the citizens. Another thing is the strengthening resilience of the country. And here we speak about the uh, concrete instruments uh, on uh, on combating um, uh, hoaxes and and uh, disinformations, and uh, we building a center for uh, combating the hybrid threats. Uh, we're going to spend uh, up to 10 million euros uh, for 55 people in the upcoming uh, two, two years. And uh, if, if not necessary, we'll definitely add up, but this is a necessary, a necessary step. Of course, we trying to uh, work with all the partners in the region, also within the NATO and being uh, part of any, any working groups uh, and, and I would say systems where, where we can share information, share best practices, uh, practices how to increase uh, how to increase the resilience of the country, especially uh, in this field. Well, and when we speak of media, like I said, uh, it's about the culture, it's about the nature, 
uh, I think it's very important the, the political communication. This is a challenge. I'm also a politician, but uh, again, here I, I, I try to be and I want to be a translator on uh, building a culture of respect. Respect to, first of all, other opinion. And I always, uh, I many times say here in Slovakia, because I lived in US for a while, that one thing I learned out of many things, but the one thing I learned in US was that when somebody has a different opinion than me, he's not my enemy. Because sometimes the people in Slovakia, they feel threatened by a different opinion. They don't really know. And that, that's where I see that the maturity of democracy is that we can listen to other opinions and not get angry. And, uh, and uh, this is where we need to uh, grow, I would say. So, uh, so definitely uh, these are the pillars, as I mentioned, uh, to bring it up. And then the media won't be, uh, or I would say that the people, the citizens will be able to discern what channel of information is valid and what is not. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we will definitely get also to the questions around NATO. I absolutely uh, love the, the reference to the newly launched center. So congratulations on that. But I wanted to ask you about another uh, national security challenge, and it's the corruption. So what does your government do to fight corruption? And also, are there any specific legislative measures and measures that can be taken by law enforcement uh, to boost domestic, but also international efforts uh, to tackle this challenge? Definitely. Uh, well, this is, uh, when we speak of corruption, there are two parts to it that you need to uh, take under supervision. One is the system, other one are the people. Because we know that any system can be abused if wrong people occupy it in general. And what we had over the decade, and I will just share facts, okay? So uh, we have, first thing we did, we said, and we said that before the election, that once we will be elected, we will free the hands of the, um, you know, of the police, of the prosecutors, of the judges, so they don't have any political burden uh, on, on doing uh, what the law requires no political order, nothing. We'll leave it up to them and tell them, please investigate uh, according to, to the, to the uh, law that we have. Well, uh, we had this national criminal agency where we had to uh, give room to experienced and I would say just uh, policemen who are long experienced. They were seeking and, and arresting all, all kinds of criminals. We told them, it's up to you, gentlemen. You, you do the, the, the work. And uh, they started to investigate. And by now we have, I would say, over 20 people who were on a different and high positions in the state who themselves say, yes, I was part of a system. So they, uh, they, they themselves, uh, how do you say in English? Uh, they confess, they, they confess that they were part of the system in front of the, the investigators, you know, in front of the, uh, the prosecutors. So this is the first step where the people um, revealed the system. They said, this is the system as it, as it worked. The second thing is we took under supervision all uh, acts and we go step by step. First thing we did, we changed the uh, vote of uh, general prosecutor and special prosecutor. We had a vote in the parliament and we established new people because as you know, both the general prosecutor previous and, and uh, special prosecutor, they didn't have a, a good, uh, good record. So, so this was changed. Then also we changed the, the court council. We re-elected uh, people into the court council in the parliament in a very public and transparent way. And we going further with the, with the um, with the transformation of the court system into a high efficiency, because we had we have a very low efficiency. The, the trust into uh, court system is is uh, around fifty percent, which is very low. is one of the lowest uh, in the region. So so this is another step that we have to we have to work toward. And uh, so I would say these are the the main steps that we that we started that was done and still is ongoing, and we will keep keep moving forward. 
Thank you. Thank you. And everybody who follows Slovakia knows that civil society and media have played a crucial role in uncovering some of the most significant cases. So if you allow me, I would also uh, like to ask you what Slovakia does, maybe as an inspiration for others, uh, to provide civil society and independent media with the necessary enabling environment to fight corruption. Yes. Well, when we speak of media, uh, as I said, um, the first, I think, uh, prerequisite necessary is to establish and uh, strengthen democracy, the pillars of democracy and the pillars of freedom. This is, uh, this is definitely the, the first uh, prerequisite that must be uh, in place. Of course, by itself, it's been always attacked, so, so it's not the only instrument. We also have um, uh, in process uh, several legislation where we want to uh, bring forth uh, the, the protection but this is a very sensitive also politically and also journalist sensitive. So we invest a lot of time into discussing it. So before we come up with a solution that it's being discussed uh, from several areas and uh, from several groups, when we speak of the civil society, this is also a long run. But the, the first thing that we're gonna, we, we had this uh, uh, plenty, Plenty, plenty potentially uh, uh, that was under the Ministry of Interior. And we're putting it back to the government, to the, uh, under the government's office. So it has higher priority. Uh, we're gonna uh, most likely uh, appoint a, a new person who is recognized in, the, in, the, uh, in this area. And uh, we want to strengthen the uh, communication with the representatives of, of uh, civil society. I myself started this tradition six months ago, where I started to do these round tables with several, several areas, uh, several people, uh, groups of people from different sectors and areas. And one of them is to meet regularly with the representatives of civil society to hear where they see uh, obstacles in the system, uh, in the communication, in the, in the people uh, who is uh, communicating less and more, so we can grow this ecosystem of uh, cooperating between the government and the civil society. So, so there's again, several pillars that uh, we, we're working on in, in order to bring this up to a higher level and educate the people that uh, this is a basic element of democracy. So uh, these are briefly uh, the, the instruments that we use. Thank you. Thank you. And you like to engage also communities from outside of Bratislava, the nation's capital. You like to travel across the country. Um, so I, I hope that that's very much appreciated. And the latest law on media is in the second round of public consultations, if I'm not wrong. So that's a really good signal of ongoing conversation about these important rules. So with that, you have already made the important announcement and about the center, but what will be the focus and deliverables for Slovakia for the upcoming uh, summit for democracy? Well, as you know, uh, Madam President will be representing Slovakia uh, uh, on the democratic summit. So. Uh, I'm glad that I have a very good relationship with, with uh, Madam President and uh, we're discussing uh, on, on personal meetings uh, the things that are happening in the government, etc. So, but on this specific question, I'll leave it up to her. So, so she, when she comes, so she, there could be also a moment of surprise, uh, but uh, no, she's preparing it. And uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a floor to leave uh, for her. But I think many things will be mentioned out of what we're discussing today. So I, I just don't want to be so specific on what she will be sharing there. And we're already looking forward to it. Thank you very much. So if you allow me, let's shift gears now and talk about uh, energy security. It's a very important topic here in the United States, but also is in Europe. Is energy security uh, the concern for your government at all? And has the Nord Stream and the agreement between the United States and Germany to allow its completion led Slovakia to find new partners and maybe even enemies cause conflicts within the EU. And then of course, there is a broader question of how should Europe approach energy security given the implications to the European Union, our member states, but also our friends in the Eastern partnership. Yeah, I think when we speak of energy, everybody uh, who is uh, watching this uh, this area knows pretty much the circumstances. 
And I would say that we are on certain crossroad. Uh, we've been there for, for a short while, but now uh, many things are changing and this crisis of pandemic, economic now crisis of energy is, is showing even more the weaknesses of this current system that we have. And I think every government must be concerned about the, the, the energy security because uh, this is one of the basic uh, basic uh, sources uh, for running uh, for running the country, for the households, uh, industry, etc., for for the economy. Well, when we speak of Slovak uh, uh, energy mix, when we look at the electricity, I think the Slovakia has a very good energy mix. So we have uh, 50 percent nuclear, we have some water, and then we have renewables. Uh, Coal is uh, finishing by 2023, which is very good also from the aspect of climate. Um, and what it shows, and that's why we say very loudly that nuclear, we, I would say differently. We are a great fans of carbon neutrality. We committed to 2050, it is ambitious, but we must be ambitious if we wanna achieve it. Uh, and it's three decades from now, so there's still plenty of time we see the technical progress, we have to invest into innovations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have to have in mind the energy poverty because this is the, an issue uh, in part, some parts of, of the country, but still being focused on the goal. Uh, when we speak of the transition, we see that the nuclear must be uh, part of the solutions. This is definitely necessary because when we see that there is still a lot of countries who, who are um, depending on coal and, and it's all about emissions. I mean, we, we have to uh, admit it. So, and we know that the nuclear is from this, I would say carbon free. So, so definitely a transition, the transition uh, uh, instrument uh, for sure. Uh, when we speak of gas, that's when we speak of heating, we speak much more of gas. Yeah, there is much higher dependency, of course, uh, of, the, of the gas coming from Russia. And uh, this is a, a a long term uh, from the looking backwards, but also forward we see, and as you mentioned, the Nord Stream 2. Well, what can I say? Uh, I, I, my, I, I used to say, I usually say that I'm a realist. You know, I always try to look forward. I look what, the, what, I, what we have. I never cry all, all over spilled milk. So, so we have to work with the reality, but we have to speak, especially this situation that is happening right now in, in Europe shows that uh, the dependency is, I would say, uh, too high. I mean, we have to look for every, not every country, but European Union must become much more independent uh, from the energy perspective. And, and that's a goal that you don't achieve overnight and over a couple of years. So, so definitely we have to look for the diversification. We have to work on diversification. And uh, this is also the goal of the neutrality because as we go there will be renewables. And I think we'll definitely for several decades uh, need uh, the nuclear uh, uh, nuclear uh, source. So again, it's about long-term, but uh, it's also about cooperation because these projects are really big and, and therefore uh, we need to be very careful on the relationships that we maintain, uh, especially within European uh, Union. So briefly. I don't know if I answered everything, but if not, then uh, ask me. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will make sure to bring uh, Jonathan in at some point uh, to see if he has any uh, follow up questions or um, thoughts uh, on, on your remarks. But uh, speaking of the cooperation, I also wanted to touch upon your NATO commitments. So what exactly does Slovakia do to fulfill its NATO commitments? And more specifically, in terms of cooperation with the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, when we speak of NATO, especially us politicians, we must speak to the uh, citizens and we must make clear one thing which is not always understood, and that's the uh, collective uh, security protection, because that's all what it's about. And we used to have uh, conscripts in the past. I was uh, uh, present at the, at the Ministry of... Uh, of um, uh, defense when we were changing this whole concept because it was just too expensive. So the collective defense is the most efficient and most effective and also uh, cheapest way of, of defense. That's 
that's why it's so important to have this partnership. And that's why for us, it's so important to be uh, in NATO. Uh, and uh, I'm a great fan of this collective defense. And I also publicly share it anytime I'm, I'm being asked. Uh, and even sometimes when I'm not being asked. <laughs> but uh, what, I, what I want to say, what our government does, we stepped into an era of the greatest modernization of our equipment, a lot of uh, in the, uh, defense spending. Yes, some people might look, why are we spending so much on equipment? But the deterioration uh, effect is very important. The readiness effect is even more important, absolutely important. So, so that's why it's necessary. And uh, we want to be on the uh, on the trend of growing uh, expenses up to two percent of of GDP. We are, I think, uh, getting quite uh, good there. One point eight is for next year, so so not not far from it. But uh, like I said, these are maybe the the, the numbers that show some uh, aspect. But uh, what is most important is that we actually decided to do this massive. Uh, uh, massive investment into the uh, modern equipment. When we speak of NATO, when we speak of United States, this is definitely needed to maintain uh, this this partnership. Uh, not just for us in Slovakia, even though we do, and we I mean we have such a close connections with purchase of the F-16s, with the uh, uh, memorandum about security of our networks, and I could uh, speak of of other 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 uh, agreements that we have and that we want to continue. So, so it's definitely uh, very important to to protect this uh, NATO North Atlantic uh, um, treaty. So, uh, and and um, yeah, that's pretty much. I think I, I'm I showed I, I said what I wanted to <laughs> what I wanted to show you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And in terms of investments, I believe there is more to come. Also, when it comes to other. Um, of areas of the Slovak economy, right? And I know that this is a topic that's dear to your heart. So I'd like to use this opportunity to ask you the question about how do you plan to spend the EU budget to strengthen the country's economy through investments in key areas? And how more specifically do you plan to use these funds to benefit the people, advance democratic reforms, and also strengthen Slovakia's participation in the efforts against uh, the climate change? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is this is a very good perspective to look at the, the money, uh, to actually show the people what is going to be the outcome and, and uh, the democratic uh, values, as you mentioned, and the climate, this goes hand in hand uh, with the responsibility, as I was speaking, the freedom to responsibility. So it's so important to always maintain and, and um, improve the environment because if you don't invest, then it doesn't stagnate, it, uh, it demolishes. So, so that's very important is, uh, to educate uh, people on this principle. So uh, the recovery and resilience plan, and I, I like the, the, the name, it was, uh, this whole plan was named. It's, it's a very uh, deep and detailed, uh, detailed plan. I would like to show you two, two pub publications. This is our manifesto. And I want to show you the thickness of this manifesto of the government that every government has for four years. Well, for the first time in the history, our government, and based on the, the pandemic and based on the decision of the European Commission that we have to for the funds to have a plan, this is what we have for five years. It's the recovery plan. You see the thickness? So it's not just about some ideas, about some numbers, but it's also about a roadmap. It's, it's milestones, it's targets, it's, it's actually a very well and thought through plan. And all the countries that submitted it have this kind of plan. And that's why uh, it's so important. Uh, it can bring a lot, of, uh, a lot of results if it's implemented well. And that's where the greatest challenge is. So we have five areas. There, was, there were some preconditions from the European Commission. We know that it was green or climate. 37% out of the envelope was supposed to be invested. And we said 43, because we want to have these invest, uh, investments into these areas that it's uh, so needed. But we decided for two national uh, top priorities. And first is the education, as I mentioned, because it's so important for the long term, for building up the democracy, for the building up the mindset uh, of, of freedom toward responsibility. 
about the critical thinking, about uh, how to think, not what to think. Because the regime of communism was teaching us what to think, but the democratic uh, regime, uh, if I may say uh, it this way, uh, is enforcing how to think, the critical thinking. So that's why the education with uh, reforms of the curricula, starting from the elementary school, investing into the uh, uh, preschool, et cetera, et cetera, reaching our university as least one uh, in top uh, 500 in the world and second in, in uh, top, uh, top thousand. So many investments and many, many reforms uh, going around this. The second priority is the health because we see that the resilience of our of our nation especially with these new viruses and variants etc this we might see more often that we have to be resilient and it's also about the quality of life so so climate and uh, and uh, education but also an efficient state and there we speak public procurement transparent one where you push the, the corruption to the very possible levels. You don't give much room of the corruption because you bring this light into the room, as, as I like to say. So the transparency uh, and also uh, the, the reform of the court system, as I mentioned, uh, uh, et cetera. All these steps are also mentioned in the plan, they're ongoing. And uh, these are the top uh, priorities. Of course, digitalization as a 21st century, it, it's it's very important uh, step. Uh, which is part of education, it's part of, of, of uh, also effective state. And one thing we added specifically, and that's the innovations. We committed uh, 600 million into this envelope, investing into not just uh, ecosystem, because that's more reforms, but also um, not enforcing, but bringing, bringing funds on a fair uh, uh, process for innovation. So, because we see that uh, there are companies in Slovakia who've been very successful in the world as a startups and they grew as very successful companies. But we, we want to have much more of them because we see that there is potential. So that's why we building uh, also a new infrastructure for the, building this ecosystem for innovations. And we as a country with this automotive industry, we want to build up on this and uh, increase or create um, a room for uh, labor with higher added value so that's why the envelope of innovation with the reform package is very important as a, as a part of our recovery plan thank you thank you and we have more and, questions okay and one more thing i didn't mention and that's the uh that's the climate uh and when i speak of the industry because we have automotive industry but we do have also heavy industry with uh, with heavy emissions and uh, what is interesting in slovakia when we speak of the emissions we have, I would say, maybe up to 10 uh, greatest or biggest polluters, and that, that they cause more than 80% of the problem, problem uh, challenge, I would say. So that's why we uh, have another up to 400 million uh, where we want to offer it to the market and they should come up with solutions and uh, reduce these this, uh, pollutions uh, uh, in their industry. And uh, so, so there's so there's several several companies. As you know, the the biggest polluter, uh, and I don't say it in any negative way, please, is of course uh, the the steel factory in the Eastern Slovakia, which is uh, on the other hand very important employer. And uh, Eastern Slovakia, I see as a, with great potential being a second cluster because the automotive cluster is mostly in the western part of Slovakia. But we want to strengthen the, the we have universities in Košice, which is the eastern part, uh, and, and we want to strengthen the education there and also the innovations there and also uh, the decarbonizations, especially there. But there are other other places, uh, like I said, up to 10, 10 places who uh, if we uh, resolve uh, with these investments, uh, the decarbonization, it will get rid of our uh, problem with the with the pollution. Thank you. Thank you. And transitioning to green economy is certainly not going to be an easy task because there will be um, jobs lost and so on. Uh, but this has been a fascinating conversation so far, uh, Prime Minister. Before I ask uh, more questions from our audience, I'd like to turn to uh, our own Jonathan Katz to see if he has any uh, thoughts, uh, follow-up remarks uh, on um, your points. Yeah, Mr. Prime Minister, it's it's really refreshing one to hear about everything that's happening domestically, 
I mean, this the upcoming summit uh, for democracy is not only about sort of the international response to a number of issues that are all interconnected from the democracy to economic to climate change. So on one hand, it's incredibly um, heartening to hear, you know, all the work that's being done. And we followed it closely too when we've had a previous minister of justice join us at GMF for a previous event that we did to talk about some of these rule of law reforms at home. And so I think this is really important. I, I guess my question for you, and, and it was posed in one of the questions as well, was about, about the V4. Um, the summit is not going to include all of your V4 partners, uh, including uh, obviously Hungary is not going to be at that table. Um, and I guess the question a lot of us have here in Washington, and I think this is a challenge in Brussels when, when looking at, at, at Central Europe is how to get democracy back on track regionally. And I, I wanted to ask you about where you see, you know, how you see Slovakia's role in, in sort of make, you know, making Central Europe a shining example of democracy and human rights and not exposed, and I, I understand, and I think your commitment on countering hybrid aggression reminds us too that countries that are, are less democratic, more corrupt, are more susceptible to the impacts of governments or malign actors that seek to, to move, um, particularly in Europe, um, away from democracy, split the transatlantic alliance, and, you know, it, it seems like Slovakia is sort of on the front lines of democracy, trying to push in the other direction. But you have really borders that and, and partners within the V4 that maybe don't share that direction. So how do you move that? Um, how do you move that forward in the right direction? What are these, you know, what are some of the steps to strengthen regional democracy cooperation? And I think overall cooperation so that we have not only a strong Central Europe partnership, a strong EU, but also a strong transatlantic community, including NATO, that doesn't have potentially weak links that are susceptible to maybe to China or to or Moscow. And I think this is very much on the minds of many in Washington about what's taking place uh, in your region, and also it's not just regionally, it's, it's global as well, including in the United States. So I, I, and it's, a, it's a big question, uh, and we, we look to your, to your wisdom on, on how, to, how to navigate this and what Slovakia is bringing to the table. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a great, great era. Uh, first of all, we need to learn from our history. And uh, we need to look at the best practices. And um, that's why I will start with three quotes that we often use. And one is that build on experience and on expertise. Second is cooperate. And the third is never give up. So these are the principles that we apply every day <laughs> to survive and to really uh, moving forward. When we speak uh, of the V4, I had just, uh, I have regular meetings with my staff and we've been, uh, today we've been speaking about our presidency, Slovakia in the V4 that starts July next year. And we were thinking of what we want to people uh, not just remember, but what, what will be the, the main idea of, of the V4 presidency of Slovakia within the V4? I said, well, the most important thing is that we want to be a trendsetter uh, in rule of law and uh, free society. And, and, the, and freedom toward responsibility, as I mentioned. And this is, this is what should be the presidency be about. And, uh, you know, we four, it's, it's got great potential because any cooperation has got potential if it works toward the greater cooperation. We are, like I said, we are part of European Union and we are proud member of European Union. We want to uh, remain because we see the benefits out of it. But we four is part of European Union. And if it helps and if it strengthens the whole environment of European Union, then it's it's very helpful. And this is what we need to work toward. And that's where we want to be a translator and leader uh, in this topic. And uh, when you when you when we speak about how to do it, well, as I mentioned, there is uh, in the systems you have or in the in the whole uh, speaking of democracy, of the values, you have people and you have system. 
but it all is being based on the education. And this is a long-term process. As I said, 32 years ago, we had the Velvet Revolution, and we still see some areas where we didn't move forward much, where we kind of repeated. We came back, and now we have to go again. And uh, I would say the failure shouldn't be an, uh, something to stop us. It should be to actually motivate us to be a better with the second with with the second try. So we have to be very clear on communication. We need leaders. We need communicative leaders in communication in the political arena, especially who are who are representative of values of justice, of of uh, uh, truth, of of humbleness. So, I mean, the basic values must be represented among the politicians, and uh, that's why we need to put so much effort on the communication. That's a short term. That's where we can. We, uh, I always say that I, I look for allies for for democracy, for uh, a be, for the best solutions for Slovakia, for the best solutions for Europe. So this is about cooperation, about speaking truth to the people, not being um, not being populistic, uh, not trying to or uh, how would I say uh, to resist the, the the temptation of being popular, because. I think the history showed that if leaders do sometimes unpopular um, uh, moves, but the people understand it's for their good, they will keep their popularity in long term. We should not look for instant solutions. We should not look for instant popularity. So it's it's a difficult challenge, but it's about leadership, I think, mostly. Can I just ask one follow-up question too? Because I, I can't help, uh, you know, I think what you said, uh, you know, about allies and allies for democracies are really important. Um, I, I did want to just sort of ask you a couple of questions about some of the summit has three, summit for democracy has three main themes of human rights and uh, addressing corruption, but also the authoritarian side of, of, of the ledger. And maybe just some thoughts to just, um, we talked a little bit about, and we know that your government has been incredibly active on Ukraine um, and uh, in the region of Belarus as well, uh, both statements from your government, the foreign minister and others about freedom, democracy, human rights, um, just just Russia too, because it's it occupies a lot of attention and has recently, including with the buildup of, of forces um, uh, that threaten Ukraine. Maybe just speak to you know how you think, uh, both from the perspective of Bratislava, but also your partners at NATO and the EU and the United States, how we should be approaching this 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 challenge. And we see it through energy crisis, um, you know, in Europe too, uh, which has different impacts depending on on the countries within the Europe, including many EU member states. Maybe just. I just had a quick question about Russia because I think it will be yeah. this challenge will be front and center at the summit, but it, it occupies so much yeah. of the attention in Washington of the national security community. Well, uh, when we speak of uh, Russia uh, at the US EU summits, uh, one thing we realize because we've been speaking about it that the European Union should have uh, like a common um, position on Russia. Well, this is not easy to achieve with the historical mm, links of, diff, of the countries of, within the European Union. You see these countries on, on Baltics that have totally different uh, narrative on relationship with, with Russia. Then you see big countries as, as, as uh, Germany finishing the Nord Stream 2, maybe France, then you have other countries. And, and speaking of a common uh, narrative is not easy to achieve. And uh, that's why I say it's very important to put all the cards on the table before we decide what's going to be uh, the game. Because if some card is missing, then it's not fair. And there is then too much, too much um, hidden agenda. So, so I think uh, every time we, we are truthful and we look the full truth into the face, then we are able to agree on solution and we are able to bring a solution if we work toward the better uh, or higher good, I would say. So uh, for us, we have also some history with Russia. As I said, we are uh, having gas from Russia. 
we cannot avoid this. I mean, there are, this is like a, like a, one of the, the veins into our system. So we, we, we have to speak to them as a, as a partner. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean that you take everything what they provide. So that's why we should be the leaders. Europe and United States should be leaders of the values of the developed democratic values. And on the other hand, we, it's about influence. The politics is mostly about influence. Who is influencing who and how? And, uh, and fair, fair methods, uh, even though sometimes bring uh, slower uh, results, but lasting results. And that's the importance. So uh, I think the, 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 the main players, the big countries, of course, should put on board also the, the, the smaller countries and really uh, seeking, um, uh, and, uh, seeking a solution, which is not going to be easy because it's so much intertwined, I would say. So this is a definitely difficult question that you asked, but our Slovakia made a big step forward because after 15, 16 years, we, uh, we approved in the parliament our new security strategy where we, we refreshed it. And we also said uh, uh, on Russia well, that uh, Russia is a challenge. It's a challenge uh, uh, for this region. And we have a specific uh, wording there. Uh, and uh, that's why I think we need to be honest at the same time, respecting, respectful, but uh, really working together on, on difficult topics and not look for instant solutions because they don't work. And, and Russia belongs definitely among them. Thank you, Prime Minister. And these are all very difficult questions. We didn't even get to discuss COVID uh, today. And uh, again, everyone who follows Slovakia knows that the country has been going through a lot. Um, I wish I could ask you whether we will see mandatory vaccination in Slovakia, for example, but don't feel pressure to respond to that question just because we are getting to the end of our time together. Uh, today, I would like to say that this has been a treat for me uh, um, to interview you today. Um, and with that, uh, before handing it over to Jonathan, I would like to ask you for any concluding remarks on or thoughts that you have to share with our audience. Yes, well, first of all, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me uh, to be part of the, this discussion. I think the bottom line is that there is no better system than democracy. There is no better system than democracy of freedom toward responsibility. And we should realize one thing, it doesn't come for granted. Everyone has to work toward it. It's not as difficult, it's not as easy, but once you do it every day, it, it becomes uh, something natural to us. So please be allies of uh, democracy, be allies for freedom toward responsibility. And, and uh, I'm sure that we'll together make a better world. Martina, I think that's my, my cue to jump in. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, you know, you've been, uh, I, I, you know, as Martina mentioned, we know that the country has been going through a very challenging uh, time with COVID. And, and as I expressed earlier, we, you know, we send our best thoughts and wishes. And we, we have seen governments globally, including the United States, um, really uh, challenged to deal with uh, this issue. Um, and I think that, you know, even the summit for democracy um, and the efforts there um, coming out of it are largely related to ensuring uh, good governance, transparency, accountability, freedom of information in particular. And um, I think th that your government's leadership role has been critical in this. And I also said earlier, I think it's refreshing to hear you know, governments that are actually digging down in the weeds on challenges from economic issues to environmental issues to um, transitioning economies in a world and a global economy that has been hard hit over the last year and is facing some, some difficult challenges. Um, what, what we do see, though, is that the call for allies uh, to advance democracy, I think, is exactly um, I don't work for the Biden administration, but I'm sure they're applauding because that's what they're really looking at is to, to, to build that base of democ democratic supporters in your government, including those that represent you in Washington, D.C., have really been sort of engaged in, uh, in a most significant way to advance these goals. Uh, and so on behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group in Washington, we want to really thank you so much 
for joining us. We hope we can host you again. Uh, maybe next time it will be in, in Washington, D.C., uh, when things are a bit better, uh, maybe uh, in the follow-up year of action post-summit uh, for democracy and the 2022 summit, uh, there'll be opportunity to, to engage with you. And uh, on that note, I want to thank Martina, who will over my colleague as well, for an excellent job moderating uh, and colleagues here in Washington, D.C. Um, we look forward, whether it's in Bratislava or in Washington, to engaging with you and your government uh, we also wish you well in dealing with some of these immediate challenges and looking forward very much to seeing uh, your president's uh, 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 speech and statement and what the gov your government is planning to commit to um, as part of the summit. We've already gotten a glimpse of some of the, uh, some of the deliverables. Hopefully, I, I don't think, Mr. Prime Minister, you've spilled the beans um, on, on, on everything, but we're really looking forward to, to, uh, to seeing what your government is up to, uh, both not only just in, internally, but also regionally as well, and then also globally. Uh, and so on that note, we really appreciate your participation and we look forward today and we look forward to our next conversation with you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All, right. all the best. And to all of our participants, thank you so much for joining this morning and this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I am sure you're gonna be rushing off to go to your next meeting. Thank you so much. And from Washington, everybody have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.